Hey, Fire Behavior crew, uh, welcome. I wanted to put some audio to this PowerPoint to help you kind of catch these concepts. Before you look at the atom, which uh, you're going to do in Chapter 2 with the book and with the PowerPoint related to that, um, I think we need to just kind of step back and look at the big picture of fire chemistry. Um, our old book did it that way, but it doesn't as much in this new book. Um, so, I won't do this every time. Um, I think that between the book, the videos that I give you, and the PowerPoint, that you can catch the concepts that you need to take the quizzes and do the projects. Um, this is not an online live course or Zoom course. Or we would, um, or maybe in some of my uh, schools that I teach at, it might be online live. But um, I think that it's best uh, quite often for you just to look through the material, catch the concepts. But I'm here to answer questions. I'm here to interact with you, especially during the discussions and all of that. So without further ado, let's go. First of all, I think I'm going to make myself go away. I think I, I tried this last time and it worked. So I'm going to click on this one thing and I think that makes me go away. So um, let's keep going. I'm going to jump down to the introduction. So uh, we're going to talk about basic information related to fires and chemicals that we might encounter as firefighters. So understanding, the more we understand these chemicals, and recognize, e even if you don't remember all this stuff, listen, not, most firefighters are not chemists. Some people really like science. They get into all of that stuff, and they've got it. But most of us, there's so much that you have to learn as a firefighter. Uh, I always say re firefighters are renaissance men so um, and women. Uh, firefighters uh, have to learn a lot about uh, a little about a lot of things. So um, we need to be able to kind of have some understanding of fire so that we can recognize those situations that are not your everyday uh, house fire or commercial fire or wildland fire. When we, Just like a wildland firefighter needs to be able to recognize when they're in a situation where the fire behavior is going to increase rapidly and they are in danger, we need to be able to recognize um, fires that are involving chemicals or whatever. So um, the more we know, the better. So it all starts with matter. The more we understand about just the basics here, the better. So matter, what is matter? It's anything that occupies space and has mass, right? Something that occupies space and can be perceived by one or more of the senses is considered matter. So um, matter has a physical appearance and physical properties uh, of the matter. Some matter is invisible, like gases. But um, uh, mass, size, and volume is we talk about as descriptors of matter. Matter comes in three states, three states of matter. Solids, pretty easy to understand, liquids, and gas. So let's talk about solids. Um, solids have a clear and consistent shape, okay? A definite volume, a definite shape. Um, things that are solids really can't be mixed unless they're heated up or compressed or something like that. Solids are pretty solid. <laughs> and, uh, you know, we can melt our metals and mix them together and make uh, different kinds of metals uh, and things like that. But for the most part, you take two pieces of metal and you clang them together, they, they resist each other. They're solid. They have definite volume, definite shape. Now, liquids are similar, but one very important difference. They have definite volume, but they do not have definite shape. So liquids take the shape of the vessel that they're in. So, uh, it, you know, when we uh, take 
liquids and put them in a bottle. We put them in a pool. We put it in the sink. They are going to take on the shape. Now what happens if you pull the plug on the sink? Then all the water rushes down with gravity. Um, liquids are subject to gravity. Uh, they're going to go where gravity takes them. So uh, liquids don't go uphill. They go downhill. Um, so, you know, liquids have a shape, but they take the shape of that which is containing them. And liquids are also subject to turning into gases, our third state of matter. So under heat or under um, pressure, uh, they can change uh, in, in their nature. Now, liquids can't be compressed, but uh, they can be pressed to somewhere. So maybe I shouldn't, you know, under pressure and heat, they can change into a gas. Um, so gases. Well, gas is very important for us to understand because as firefighters, that's our scariest uh you know gases are, are like trying to catch a slippery pig you know chasing in or around a, a an arena like they do in those rodeos sometimes um it, it's it's has no definite shape has no definite volume so therefore gases can freely move um some gases rise some gases sink we t uh, call that it's um specific gravity no i don't think that's it um, it's in a couple of slides so it, the shape can be determined by an amount of pressure placed upon it and when it's placed in a container so liquid uh natural gas or liquid petroleum gas lpg is what we commonly call propane they compress it and they put it in a container it's actually liquid on the bottom and then gas on top. And then that gas will fuel um, a stove or a heater or whatever. So flammable gases are those ones that at, at atmospheric pressure, temperature and pressure, they can mix with enough oxygen. And as long as they have enough oxygen and they're in their flammable range, they're high and low, um, they will ignite or even explode so uh, all materials contain either inorganic or organic uh, matter so all all materials are either inorganic or organic organic things are 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 or once were living organisms and they consist of carbon hydrogen and oxygen inorganic things are are, are things that are like rocks, soil, air, water, and minerals. They're not living things, but um, they, most of them, not involved in the combustion process. Um, organic things burn. Organic things uh, uh, are subject to uh, pyrolysis and subject to um, corrosion and that whole process. Cells um, is a very important term we need to understand. So cells are the tiny mass of protoplasm, usually containing a, a nucleus, um, smallest structural unit of living matter. So um, uh, we talk about the atom, and we'll talk about that in a second, capable of functioning independently. Um, we have all these cells in our bodies, and they make up our human body. Organic chemistry is important firefighters because we need to understand those things that um, do burn that are organic and uh, contain cells and and they uh, can burn so um, when we're talking about um, atoms when you know let's skip down i'm going to jump down atoms are the basic building blocks of matter they're the smallest unit of an element taking part in a chemical reaction so atoms, um, you're going to look at that in the next lecture, and it'll go into it in depth. But each element has a particular nature, and it's, a lot of it is based on the protons. So the, you'll, you'll learn about that. Um, the protons determine, so how many protons 
are in an atom tells you what element it is. So hydrogen always has one proton. One proton. So um, now compounds are substances that are formed from two or more elements that are joined and, and uh, with a fixed ratio. So consists of chemically combined molecules and uh, they can have a definite composition regardless of their origin, location, size, or shape. In our next chapter, we're going to talk about chemical change versus physical change. Some things, uh, uh, you know, when you put two elements together, it changes its, uh, its chemical. So it's a chemical change. It becomes something different. But sometimes when you put things together, they physically change. And we'll talk about that later. Elements can be separated, though, by physical means, and, you know, that's the atom bomb. Um, so approximately 5 million compounds have been identified, but there's more. There, it's, so the structure of the molecules, like look at a, a wood, piece of wood. Um, the wood we think of as having cells and the cell wall, but within that cell wall, what is there? There's molecules. And within that, atoms. So the structure of the atom consists of three types of particles, subatomic particles, the protons, the neutrons, and the electrons. So the nucleus is in the center, and it has the protons and the neutrons. The neutrons have, uh, are heavy, and they don't have an electrical charge. The protons will be equal in weight to the neutron and contains a positive electric charge. Now orbiting around them are those electrons and those electrons are very important and you will study about that as you look at the um, PowerPoint about atoms. So um, there's 109 elements that have been identified and as I said atoms combine with other atoms to fill outer electron shells. They call that the valence. Uh, so, or rid themselves of ele extra electrons. So, these electrons that are going around, if you have an element that's stable, it's full. All of its outer shell is full. It has a tendency not to mix with other things and, and just basically stays to itself. But, if that outer shell has empty it's, uh, spots, like, they're like parking spots. You know, the nucleus is like the mall, and the shells around the nucleus is where the electrons go, and those empty parking spots are the furthest out. And those empty parking spots are places where electrons from other atoms can join them. So when you have a hydro, hydrogen has an empty uh, outer shell, one empty. There's there's two, and one one electron with hydrogen, and then there's an empty shell. So something else like carbon will combine with it, and you get a hydrocarbon. Okay. So and you can have multiple ways that they can get together. So hydrocarbons we think of as being our fuels. So depending on how those hydrogens and carbons combine, we get automobile gasoline, diesel, propane, uh, kerosene, all the paint thinner, all these different versions of hydrocarbons. And it's where those electrons are coming together to make a different chemical. Okay? A different, so we call that a, uh, uh, a mixture or a, a compound. Uh, so the atom's behavior can be determined by those number of electrons in the outer shells. So elements, basic construction materials of matter, simplest form of matter, and the elements, if you look, you're going to learn about the periodic table a little bit uh, in this chapter, they, they're, they have categories where they have like qualities. So on the far left, for our left, 
it's right, <laughs> of the periodic table is um, those hydrogen and others that are like it, that have one empty, or, or one, I'm sorry, electron on the outer shell. And um, on the other side, you have the noble gases. And the noble gases all have full outer shells. So they don't mix with other things. And in fact, they're pretty doggone stable. You can make them mix with something through force and through temperature, but they, they're stable. So depending on how many of those empty electrons on the outside is its tendency or lack of tendency to mix with other products. So uh, each element has a symbol and it's good for you to know the basics of those. Um, so molecules are the smallest part of a pure chemical substance. You put two or three different hydrogens together, um, but it's still the same uh, element. That's a molecule. So molecules, smallest part of a pure chemical substance that has all the properties of that material. Okay. And um, now they can have physical change where the molecules remain intact, or they can have chemical change where the molecules are altered. So mixtures are when we, we put different um, elements uh, together and liquids, we can mix them. Gases, we can mix them. Solids, a little hard to mix them, but you can. A combination of substances held together by physical rather than chemical means is a mixture. So um, I'm drinking an Arnold Palmer. It's a mixture of tea and lemonade. Two liquids that will mix together. They're soluble and insoluble liquids. And we'll talk about that in a second. Ingredients of a mixture retain their own properties, but they work together. And they make a yummy drink called an Arnold Palmer. So, um, as firefighters, we need to kind of learn about prefixes and suffixes. So, when we hear certain prefixes associated with a chemical, like I'll just throw one out there, methyl ethyl. You hear methyl ethyl da 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 da. Well, you, methyl ethyl keto, um, or whatever. Y you're thinking, uh oh, that sounds like something really unstable to me. Um, the suffixes are syllables added to the word at the end of the word. The prefixes are syllables added to the beginning of the word. So in fire, uh, as firefighters, we should kind of have um, radar that goes off um, when we hear certain prefixes and suffixes and understand the basics of those. Um, now, we talked about organic chemicals a little bit. Organic chemicals contain some form of hydrocarbons and carbon and hydrogen molecules, and the number of carbon atoms that combine with the number of hydrogen atoms determine the properties and reaction of the substance. Okay, so organic peroxides, when you, you have a peroxide, you've got oxygen with a hydrocarbon. Okay, any kind of oxidizer with hydrocarbons can react and create fire or explosion. Organic peroxides, very reactive, very explosive. We'll, we'll get to some examples. Um, now, the properties of chemicals, the atoms of certain elements have the same properties. Properties make their behavior predictable, which is, you know, a great tool for us. But, you know, uh, I told you all you need to download the app for the Emergency Response Guidebook, which helps us predict, um, uh, you know, gives us information so we can know what this chemical on a truck that's dripping out of the truck, what it's going to do. Is it hazardous? Is it not hazardous? Whatever. Um, so, um, but when atoms combine to create a chemical, chemical compound, now, 
the defining characteristics of the compounds are our chemical formulas. And yes, they still have uh, predictable qualities, but not as much as when something's not a mixture. Um, so when we're talking about chemicals, especially if they're liquids, we talk about their boiling point. So we're going to talk about a whole bunch of different words that you as a firefighter need to know what they mean. So uh, there's a lot of different definitions exactly of what boiling point means. But basically, it's the temperature that the vapor pressure of liquid equals the pressure of the atmosphere around it. So when a, a especially a liquid, right, gets to the point where it is so agitated that it's putting so much pressure on the vessel that it is looking for somewhere to escape and what do we get if we boil water steam it wants to escape up so the temperature at which molecules in a liquid are heated until it begins to bubble or changes to vapor so once started as long as the heat continues to be applied the boiling will continue and it'll change to vapor which vapor burns if it's a flammable material and vapor is more dangerous to us right um you know with water it's just steam now steam can burn you but it it's not flammable um, vapor pressure is the amount of pressure that's placed on a vessel um, based on the product that's inside it uh, so if you have a uh, a fuel vessel a truck that's pulling, you know, propane or gasoline or diesel or whatever, and it's inside this controlled vessel, depending on the temperature that the vapor can build up or um, can even calm down because of the boiling point. But um, as the, that, you know, pressure placed on the inside of the closed container by the vapor or molecules driven off of a flammable or heated liquid in the space above the liquid that's its vapor pressure so um they have you know ways that they test that but it's something that you will read in an sds or in uh, different literature having to do with each chemical vapor density that's um the one i was kind of thinking about earlier the vapor density with gases um, specific gravity has to do with liquids, and, and that's the word I came up with. That was the wrong one. Vapor density has to do with gases. So um, the vapor density has to do with whether a, a gas rises or sinks. So carbon dioxide is one and a half times heavier than air. So the, the vapor density is 1.5. So a higher number than one means it's heavier than air. Air is one. So if it is lower than one, then it rises. Butane gas is twice as heavy as air and has a flammability range of 1.9 to 8.5. So very volatile. Flammable vapors heavier than air are going to pool they are actually scarier to us than the ones that rise because the ones that rise will mix with the environment and will eventually dissipate and go away or at least become uh, not within their flammable range. Whereas sinkers, carbon dioxide, butane, propane, those types of gases, if they are flammable and they sink, they will pool and they will act like a liquid so they will follow with gravity so you will oftentimes hear of an explosion in a place that uses propane because they had a leak didn't know it because it sinks it they weren't smelling it and it finds an ignition source like a water heater or a something else a pilot light somewhere and boom you get this explosion and um, it's quite uh, frightening you know um, solubility is when we're talking about whether a liquid mixes or doesn't so is it soluble in water indicates the amount of a material that will dissolve and mix in water so insoluble or slightly soluble materials 
usually form layers or will float or sink or will give you a milky look to them if they're not soluble. So um, they'll either float or sink depending on that specific gravity. Specific gravity is the density of the product divided by the density of water or air. So um, in liquids, we talk a lot about the specific gravity. Uh, a, a, an oil is lighter than water. So it will rise to the top and will float. Um, a heavier product will sink. And so we need to know this, especially if we have a hazmat spill. It, it, and if we've got, you know, we're putting water on a hazardous material because it's on fire. And as it mixes with that material, is the material going to sink or is it going to float? And because if we're going to do some diking, we need to know whether it's a sinker or a floater. Um, flashpoint and fire point uh, apply to liquids and to uh, gases. Um, but as we especially talk about it with liquids, but every but thing has an ignition temperature. If it will burn, everything that will burn has an ignition temperature. When we're talking about liquids, the flash point is that point where the liquid is heated up enough to where it will give a, a slight flame, a flash. And that, if it's flash point, it will flash, but it'll go away. But the difference between flash point and fire point are usually minuscule. So a little bit more heating, and then it will flash and stay on fire. And that fire may uh, increase the heat around it and sustain that temperature of now it's at its fire point, the lowest temperature at which it will produce vapor that can t uh, sustain that continuous flame. I'm trying to go as fast as I can here. We're almost done. Um, explosive range is that range of concentrations of the materials in the air which permit the material to burn. So a lower explosive limit is its lowest ignitable concentration in air. The upper explosive limit is the highest percentage of a substance in air that will ignite. If it gets outside of that range, you might have an enormous amount of propane in a room. And it won't explode, even though you light a candle. And it's because it's too rich. That's rare, but it happens. And um, in table two five oh that's in a different book okay so don't even worry about that um so uh then we talk about ph uh with acids and our bases we want to know with liquids is it acidic or is it basic if it is in the neutral or close to the neutral it's really not harmful to us um look at you know uh an eight is like seawater and your shampoo that you use um, a six is like rainwater or urine, ew. Um, coffee is a five. Uh-oh, I drink a lot of coffee. Orange juice is down near a four. But have you ever um, used like a citrus cleanser? Because citrus has an amount of acid which will help it clean things and eat up the bad stuff. Um, soda pop, drop a, a, a penny. A dirty penny in a Coke, or any kind of soda, but especially Coke. And you take it out in a little while, and it's brassy clean, like it just came from the, the mint. Okay, and then we've got things like ammonia and others that are very basic. Now listen, anything on the extremes, whether it's a base or an acid, it will eat you. Okay? So <clears throat> if you've ever got an acid on you by accident, I used to be a pool man, and every once in a while when you're pouring the acid, you don't want to get any glugs. But if you're in a hurry and, and you're trying to, trying to go too fast, you get a little glug. And sometimes that'll splash up on your arm or on even, I've had it on my face, and whoa, whoa, whoa. Uh, it's so funny, I'm sure if the owner of the house was looking while I did this, 
because um, uh, if it got on me, the next thing you know, I'm sticking that body part in the pool. So something, if it was on my face, all of a sudden I'm putting down the acid and I'm sticking my face in the in the water. I've never, uh, I never got to the point where I jumped in the pool when I was a pool man, but I had, you know, a big part of my body in the pool more than once because of a splash of acid, because it'll eat you, and it stings like crazy. So any of those extremes, it doesn't matter if it's uh, something that's basic or acidic out on the edges, it will eat you. Be careful. Um, uh, especially if it's drank, you know, uh, yeah, you can drink some of this stuff, but as you get further out here, those people who just drink a soda pop or, you know, every other hour, it's really bad for your stomach. Um, okay, appearance and odor. We, uh, you know, we, we pay attention to these things. What does the material look like? What's the physical state? And what does it smell like? But don't rely on smell. And if you think something's hazardous, don't be going, <laughs> yeah, that might be bad for you to breathe that in and to smell it. So uh, test it with, um, with, with machines, not with your nose or with taste. Uh, yeah. The physical state of matters, um, you know, we talk about with liquid, solids, gases, or sludge. Well, um, what's that physical state we want to look at? It. Well, some of those, we need to know some of the laws. Boyle's Law says the more a gas is compressed, the more it becomes difficult to compress further and can become explosive. Charles' Law says gases will expand or contract in proportion to an increase or a decrease in temperature. So when we heat up gases, they, uh, they get irritated. And so... Um, Sublimation is uh, something that sublimes, goes straight from uh, solid to gas. Uh, compressed gases are gases that can be compressed. Uh, cryogenic liquids are liquids that have to be kept cold, um, and they're very cold. Um, so changes in physical state are what we call um, chemical reactions. So when an explosion happens from a, um, a, a like a, a ammonia tank or, or a chlorine tank or a fuel tank that is being exposed to fire and it's in a enclosed cylinder, it can blevy. That is a physical reaction. So chemical reactions occur during leaks or fire and they cause a change in the physical state. A leaking liquid can change to a gas form or, uh, um, you know, it can uh, stay in its liquid form depending on temperature and other factors. Uh, in vapor form, something that uh, is leaking may pool in lower areas if it has that higher, uh, if it's heavier than air, if it has that higher specific gravity. Okay, so um, combustible dust uh I'm going to skip all of these videos that I normally show in a in person or Zoom class. But, you know, you might want to, if, you, if it interests you, just put in YouTube combustible dust. Any organic dust can explode. And uh, so you might want to look at that. Metal dust uh, or shavings can explode or catch fire. Um, uh, grain silos every once in a while, will, will explode. Um, and it's because the particle is so small, the mass is so small, it reaches its ignition temperature faster and can catch fire or explode. Blevy, I mentioned that earlier, boiling liquid expanding vapor explosion occurs when the pressure on a tank has been um, increased because of heat and then the metal gets softened or weakened and at some point, the um, container fails, and then all of a sudden, all this flammable material is, explodes. So you have a boiling liquid expanding vapor explosion. Um, chemical reactions that are endothermic absorb energy, that are exothermic 
give off energy. An explosion is exothermic. Polymerization is when molecules, a monomer and a polymer, mix together and they expand. Now, if that happens in a container, it can cause uh, a reaction similar to a Blevy, but it's polymerization. And it will rupture the product and will continue to expand. So your yoga pants um, that are made out of polycarbons um, are made through a polymerization process. The, the, the weave of different polymers put together makes those workout clothing, under armor clothing, their, um, all of those kind of clothings are made through that polymerization product. Um, <clears throat> in our classroom, a lot of our chairs are made out of poly. So it's through a polymerization process where you put the isomer in, you put the polymer in, they mix together, and they make something new that's, that's solid. And uh, it's quite fascinating to watch. Uh, again, YouTube polymerization. Water reactive materials, anything, there are a lot of things out there that do not like water. Uh, a lot of things that uh, we need to know that. So ANFO doesn't like water. And later on, we're going to look at um, a situation with AMFO in a bunch of videos, uh, I believe in Chapter 4, maybe Chapter 5. And um, you need to know when you've got products that are going to possibly explode on you when you put water on. So uh, water-reactive materials react to water violently, um, flammable metals, um, you know, a lot of times students will say, well, Mr. Osborne, which metals are flammable metals that don't like water? And I always say, um, um, well, chromium, aluminum, titanium, uranium. You know, if it ends in an um, it's probably a flammable metal um, at the end, U-N. Uh, there are a few things that even react with air. So uh, things that ignite in air like phosphorus, potassium metal, uh, air reactive white phosphorus has to be stored underwater to prevent it from igniting. So these are products that you probably just don't want to work with, mess with, or be around. Um, oxidizers. Anything that's an oxidizer, oxidizing agents give off oxygen. So if you put that next to fire, what's going to happen? oxidizers make fires worse okay not all oxidizers are flammable but they when exposed to heat make a fire worse so they present all sorts of special hazards because they react chemically with combustible organic materials and ANFO like I just mentioned is one of those some inorganic peroxides are very reactive, sensitive to shock. You bump them, they blow up. So um, a perfect and sad, infamous, uh, a lot of people use that word wrong. Infamous doesn't mean very famous. It means famous in a bad way. Infamous. So ammonium nitrate was used to bring down the Oklahoma Federal Building. They um, blew up a uh, moving van full of ammonium nitrate and diesel fuel with a uh, they had a an explosive device I believe it, they used a phone and um, a pager or something like that and um, uh, that caused the explosion killed women children men uh, tons of people it was a horrible event in our nation's history you can watch that too um, we had an ANFO event recently in Lebanon, YouTube, Lebanon, ANFO, A-N-F-O. So there are a lot of unstable materials out there. we got to know what they are, things that decompose, polymerize, self-react, react to other things. Uh, spray foam insulation, which is sold in the aerosol container at most Hardware stores is a monomer, a, a polymer kind of a thing. It polymerizes. Uh, but once started, that reaction can't be stopped uh, when a polymerization happens. 
until the product is gone. Um, we need to be careful of those incompatible materials, know what they are. So that's why you need to know about the atom as you're going to study in this week. Oh my goodness, I've gone 40 minutes. Um, I got just a little bit left here. So incompatible materials, perfect example is ammonia and bleach. You, you put ammonia and, and bleach together and you get phosgene gas, which means you breathe it, you'll die. Catalysts are substances, products that are not created to or destroyed in a chemical reaction, but can greatly affect that reaction. So platinum is used in your catalytic converter to help burn off the excess fuel coming out of your engine. La uh, last but not least, toxic combustion products. So when we have fires, when we have chemical reactions, many of them give off toxic gases. So uh, the formation depends on the nature of what's burning or what's off-gassing and the amount of oxygen present. Some of these toxic combustion products, basically all they do is they uh, delete the oxygen or they, they press the oxygen out of the room, which can be uh, fatal to you, but many of them mix with your body in a really bad way, causing either cancer or death or all of that. And this is why we wear self-contained breathing apparatus. We use those to avoid inhaling toxic materials. Um, house fires. Don't be so quick to take off your SCBA, uh, guys and gals. You know, you, you, I know it's kind of macho to walk around in the fire and act like you're a tough guy, but you're breathing in those gases that are being given off by the stuff that burns. Okay, you can uh, read the summary here for yourself. You can pause it. I'm not going to read it. This is way too long. I'm sorry, but uh, I want to make sure you have some good building blocks as you look at the app.